Praise God, man. God's doing a good work over there. All right. We're reading out of Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 2. Well, we're really going to read verses 1 through 14. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 14. I just love the way I never know how God's going to give me a message. And he just spoke Jeremiah 29, 11 in my heart. And so I went back and studied and praise God. The Lord uh, gave me a word. Amen. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives and to the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah, the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. Verse four. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them and Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you. Neither hearken to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you. And causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, says the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. Mm -hmm. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just ask you again that you would speak this morning through your word, Lord God, and that you would say what you desire said. In Jesus' name, praise God. Jeremiah 29, 11 is probably one of the most oft-quoted scriptures of promise that we as the people of God will quote to ourselves. I mean, we probably, I mean, if you're a person that tries to quote scripture over yourself, this is, and if you're a person that quotes scripture, this is probably one of the Old Testament scriptures that you learned. Because you want to, we oftentimes want to encourage ourselves with the word of God. Amen. And that's a good thing to encourage yourself in the word of the Lord. You know, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future. And an end. isn't it good to know that God has thoughts towards us and that they're thoughts of good and that they're not of evil and that he wants to give us a future. He wants to bring us to a place of completion. Amen. So, you know, one of the things that I have to question is, and you know me, I, I, I sometimes, I, well, all the time, I got to look at it from another angle. So why is it that so often we find ourselves feeling so far away from his plans? Like, in other words, am I, am I the only one in this place that, would know, that believes that God does have a future and an expected end for me, that he, that he knows the thoughts that he thinks towards me? Do you believe in your heart that even though sometimes things in your life are going in a way that you, that you didn't want them to go, that that's not ultimately God's plan for your life, amen? That he wants good for you. Do you believe that? Yeah. And, that and, and that sometimes you don't, but you don't feel that all the time, right? The answer, I believe, is this, that we have a tendency to make choices that venture off the path of God's plan. It's okay if I still speak truth to you this morning, right? Amen. We have a tendency to, to, to make choices that venture off of God's plan. And the choices result in circumstances that we chose, but God allows in order to ultimately bring us to an intended place. God will allow you to make certain choices. And in 
those choices, he will allow certain circumstances to take place. Because he's not about changing your mind for you. He wants you to change the free will mind that he gave you. To be convinced that his way is the best way. Amen. Essentially, that's what's happened in this passage. Israel has disobeyed God in many ways for many years. Furthermore, they have ignored the warnings given by God through the mouth of his prophets as he spoke his word to his people to bring them back to the right path. Does that sound familiar to you or am I the only one in here that God has spoken to me before and yet at the same time I didn't listen and I continued on with my own plans Amen. continuing on to move in the direction that I was choosing for myself but in reality God had not really chosen Amen. for me. Amen. Now, while they were there, God continued to send correction and states that his intended result is that they will come to a place where they will seek him with all their heart and then he will be found by him. Now, I can tell you that the easy version of this message is be broken in the eyes of God. Surrender yourself to the will of God. Seek him with all of your heart and he will be found by you or you will be you will find him. That's the easy version. If we could just close it and go home and hold on to that, then we would have had the message that needed to be spoken this morning. But I don't know about you. I tend to be a little bit more complicated than that. Many times we see that things are out of whack. We have a tendency to blame everyone else for the predicament that we are in instead of recognizing that our decisions and choices played a large role that resulted in the location where we are currently residing. Now, whenever I, you know, I don't know if it's like the Holy Spirit I, it must be the Holy Spirit. You know how the Apostle Paul would turn around and say, so what shall we do? Continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. It's like the Holy Spirit was telling him, Paul, if you write this, there's going to be objectors out there that are going to say you're trying to tell people to sin so that they can receive grace. You need to go ahead and put a statement in this text right here to correct them. I feel like, you know, you can't really get everything out in, a, in an hour long message that you need to get out. One of the things that, that hit me, for instance, is, is that sometimes, and I use women as an example, it's not that men can't be in an abusive relationship. I don't really, listen, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, anybody on video. I don't really understand that. I don't understand how a man, maybe because everybody's mind is wired differently, but how a man allows himself to be abused whenever he tends to be the stronger vessel. But nevertheless, it happens, you know, there can be control issues. You can allow, men can allow their minds to be, I don't, I don't understand all that, but nevertheless, it can happen. Because sometimes abuse isn't just physical. Sometimes it's emotional. Sometimes it's verbal, right? But at some point in time, I feel as though the way my mind is wired, I'm like, dude, I'm out. <laughs> I'm not going to stay under this situation. And that's one of the things that I wanted to say is that you might have a situation, might even be by some chance some lady that's under physical abuse. And she's like, well, so you're trying to say that I made choices that led to my situation? Well, this is what I would say about that. You know, it's never your fault if you're in an abusive relationship and somebody is treating you improperly, physically, emotionally, verbally. I don't believe that that's your fault. It's the person's fault that's doing the abuse. But you won't convince me that along the way there weren't little hints and signs that were trying to deter you or detour you from going in the direction you were going. Don't, you're not going to convince me of that. It might get somebody mad for me to say that, but I've lived life. I've been 53. I think I'm going to be 50. I, think. I don't even know. I try to forget my birthdays now. I don't want to get old. Okay. It just is what it is. Dude. It's, I'm not lying. But what I'm trying to say is this. Is that people might get frustrated, but I've lived life long enough to know that the Lord is, the Lord sends hints. Even to people that don't know him, there's hints, man. And they're like road signs. They're like, bridge out up ahead. Turn around. Don't keep going. But what do we do? Yeah. Ah, that's probably not really. That's not even real. That, just go ahead and just move forward, man. It's going to be all right. And so we find. So I don't feel like that, you know, somebody's supposed to stay in a situation like that. Because what well, a lot of my message is about this morning is that Israel is in a place called Babylon. And God's saying, you're going to stay right there for a while. And don't blame me for it because you kind of got yourself in it. But it's going to be all right because I have a future and a hope for you. I have an intended result for you. Hallelujah. Hold on, right? right. Don't let go. Mm -hmm. The 
point that I was trying to make is that we always have a part that we played. There are choices that we make that push us towards our destinations because it's what we want at that moment, even if it's not what God wants. And many times we ignore the warning signs that should have veered us in a different direction. Ultimately, God's word was that he had good plans for them. But right now they're prisoners in a foreign land. And yes, God put them there. But the reason that he put them there is because they ignored all the warnings he sent through his prophets. Yeah. Point number one, wherever you are now, you have to live for him there. That's right. Wherever you are right now, you have to live. No, this is what I'm trying to say. If you're a child of God, if you've been born again from the dead, I'm talking to Christians this morning. If you are a child of God and you've been born again from the dead, wherever you are right now, you have to make a choice that you are going to live for him. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. See, this is where you are right now. So today make a choice that by his grace, you will live for him. I have a sub point for point number one. <laughs> for the negative cycle to end, we will have to surrender and wait on his time. You know that sometimes there's a very negative cycle that follows us around, almost like a dog chasing our tail, or better yet, like the children of Israel wandering in a wilderness for 40 years, and it never stops, nothing ever changes. For the negative cycle to end, we will have to surrender and wait on his timing. Look at verse 5 again. Verse 5 and 6 of Jeremiah 29, 29, 5 and 6. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. It's like he was telling Israel, it's going to be a while. Hmm. Settle down, get married, build a house because whether you like it or not, you're going to be here a while. It's a hard thing to allow the mind to see the way that God sees. You know, his word repeatedly explains that true joy and fulfillment and hope will only come through following his will. That's right. Yet we seek for happiness outside of his will so often and then spend so much time being miserable over the choices that we made. Yes. Amen. We don't like where we are, so we move to a new location. Listen, we don't have to be specific here. You know what I'm saying? It applies to all kinds of aspects of our life. It applies to church. It applies to work. It applies to relationships, the house I live in, on and on and on. I'm unhappy, so I move. But each time I move, I still move outside of God's will, expecting different results. But never, anything is never really changing. We might not like where we are right now, but at some point we need to hear the voice of God and hear him say, stop. Settle down, quit running and looking, and live for me right here. Yeah. Right here where you are. Can, can you trust me with grace to get you through this season, this moment in your life? Yes. Mark 8 and 36 says this, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? Mankind looking and trying to gain everything that he can possibly get his hands on continues to leave him empty to the point where he doesn't know. But yet at the same time as he strives to gain and grab a hold of, he ends up in the process possibly losing his own soul. Look at Luke 9, 23 and 24. He said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. What I'm trying to say is, is that there's such a huge part of the gospel that's talking about death of self. You understand what I'm saying? For the untrained ear, they may think, the wrong thing. We're not talking about some kind of physical death. We're not talking about hurting yourself. We're not talking about you being, uh, you know, removed from this physical earth right now. What we're talking about is, 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 a, is a spiritual process that takes place. See, Jesus died in the physical and he bore our sin upon him so that something would be broken in the spiritual. When we were born of Adam, we were born in sin and sin gave Satan the legal right to hold us in bondage. But when Jesus died and bore our sin upon him at the cross, that spiritual bondage was broken in the heavenly realm, in the spiritual realm. And because of now that you're seated in Christ, now you have a new position and 
the Father sees you as righteous, you have access to grace. Grace can flow into the midst of your situation and your circumstance and begin to change you. But he will begin to also, he changes not just your circumstance, he changes you. Amen. Death to self. Death to self and all his grandiose ideas. Death to all of his own plans if they're outside of the will of God and they don't line up to the will of God. How do you know the will of God? you got to know the word of God. And if you're not willing to learn the word of God and instead you're going to learn all of your stuff from the way that the world teaches, then you're really going to continue in the negative cycle for God only knows how long. Until you finally come to the place of brokenness and surrender and say, okay, Lord. I've used it before, but like the old fight. I'm an old guy. I told y'all that already. The old boxing match between Roberto Duran and Sugar Ray Leonard. Poor guy. Couldn't see anymore. He was tougher than nails. But at some point in time, he threw his hands up in the air and said, no mas. I don't want any more. And sometimes we have to get to that place in our life where we're like, no mas. I don't want any more. I don't want no more trouble. I, I, Lord, just, I just bow my knee to you and I surrender. John 17, 13 through 15. This is a prayer that Jesus is praying. He's about to go to the cross. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going back to the Father. And he knows that his disciples are going to be left behind. It says right here, Now come I to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. His joy. And <laughs> once again... If we're looking for the wrong kind of joy, we're going to be left empty. But Jesus said, my disciples, I need them to be filled with my joy. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Have you ever wondered why sometimes things seem contrary on the world? I'm talking to Christians again. I mean, listen, you're either a Christian or you're not this morning. If you're a Christian, then that means that you at some point in time recognize the fact that you were a sinner. You believed in your heart that Jesus died for your sin. You needed him to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sin. And when you did that, the Holy Spirit moved into your heart and your life has never been the same. I don't know how long ago it was. That's not the issue. The issue is if you're saved, you know it this morning because the word of God says this, that when you believed the gospel, that you received a, an earnest of your salvation. You received an earnest of the Spirit, a down payment of the Spirit. That means that when you got saved, if you got saved, the Holy Spirit moved in your heart, and no matter what anybody can tell you, you know that since that day, you have not been the same. I'm not talking about you've done everything right. No, that's not what I'm saying. Matter of fact, Christians many times don't do things right. As a matter of fact, every day we miss the mark. But let me tell you this. You know that since that day, you hadn't been the same. No matter how deep in sin you've been, since that day, it hadn't been the same. You couldn't enjoy sin the way that you used to enjoy sin. You couldn't just continue to do everything that you wanted to do because now the Holy Spirit lived on the inside of your heart. And that spirit that lives in you is contrary to the spirit of the world. Amen. 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 And then, and then the two of them are in disagreement with one another. Amen. But Jesus is saying, I'm about to go to you, Father, and i got to leave them here. So I'm asking that your, my joy would fill them. The world hates them because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil. That's sub point number one. You're right here. You're, this is where you are right now, so you got to live for him. It, now, this is on a macrocosmic scale, talking about on the big picture. You're on this earth temporarily, and this earth is not your home. Amen. Amen. That's right. It's not your home. Listen, if you can't get a revelation of eternity with God and that the word of God says that, then that's where you're going to build your house. That's where you're going to live your life in the, in the, in the belief that there's something greater than what you're experiencing today. Then you're going to be upset. For the rest of your life. But listen, if you if we will learn to surrender, to submit and to desire to live for the will of God in our lives in this temporary vapor of life that we have, then things are going to be better. But then on the microcosmic scale, you're in the you're in a certain destination, maybe because of choices that you make. Yeah. Yeah. And in this season of your life right here, you got to make a choice to live for him. 
You know, this is a very deep and mature spiritual thought, but let me try. If you are truly saved, I said this already, the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of this evil age that is controlled by Satan are against each other, but you're here for an appointed time. So if you attempt to find your joy outside of God's will, you will instead find the opposite. God's people are called to live in this world for His glory, not theirs. That's a revelation right there. Hard pill to swallow, but the truth. Amen. Because we got a selfish nature on the inside of us. And so oftentimes I want what I want and I want to get it right now. And you're not the only one in here that feels that way. Amen. 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 All right, sub point number two is while waiting on his timing in the place where you are, seek peace. He will send his peace where you are and there his peace you will find. Amen. In other words, he's telling the children of Israel, don't you start praying that Babylon will be destroyed. Don't you start praying that I would overtake Babylon because you want to see your enemy that holds you captive destroyed. Because you put yourself in this situation. And if I choose to destroy Babylon, there's going to be, a, there's going to be some chaos. And God will do it in his timing because Persia ended up taking over Babylon. But you think that there wasn't some chaos that took place during that period of time until things were settled back out. And God put in place what he wanted in order to bless his people. Point being is, is that wherever you are, you need to that, pray that the peace of the Lord would show up right there yes. where you are today. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And he can do that because he's the God of glory. So while waiting on his timing in the place where you are, seek peace. He will send his peace where you are and there is peace. You will find. Look at verse 7 of Jeremiah 29. It says, seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. If, if you will pray for peace and I will send peace to Babylon, then you're going to be in peace. Amen. He didn't go over to the he didn't say go over to the next town, ask for peace. He said, ask for there to be peace where you are and live and trust him while you're there. Look at Philippians 4, 7. I love this scripture. I always use this scripture. It says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The word understanding means the human mind, the intellect, the emotion. See. I know I say this a lot, but because we're physical creatures and we experience life through what we see, taste, smell, and feel, we have a tendency to believe that the only way we can change a circumstance is for us to make a change that will change the way we feel or change what we're experiencing in the physical. But God is more concerned about our faith than He is our feelings. Yeah. God's more concerned about our faith than He is our feelings. Yeah. And one of the things that the word passeth means, what, what the word passeth means is over the top above. In other words, it exceeds what was expected. So while you might be in a place that you don't like being, you might be an Israelite that's been carried captive to Babylon, and you might like, there's even a spot where in, that, that they talked about in the, during, during their Babylonian captivity that they hung their harps in the trees because basically their song had been stolen from them. And, and, and their captors said, well, why don't you play us a song now? Why don't you play us a song that reminds you of where you used to come taunting them? And, yeah. and you know, sometimes the enemy will come and he'll try to, well, I, I probably I'm like, go on, that's a good message right there. We need to preach that. Sometimes the enemy will taunt you after you done tried to hang your harp up in the tree. And he'll say, where's your song now, big boy? Yeah. Where's your song now, mama? You said you was going to serve the Lord. And look at you now. You're a captor in a foreign land. And you're so unhappy that you can't sing anymore. No. The Lord said, pray for peace where you are right now. I will show up. I will bring peace. And while you wait on me, hallelujah, to do what I'm going to do, I'm going to be there right with you if you will just trust me and hold on to me. And you will bring a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's over and above. It's beyond what could have been expected. Your physical eyes could not have seen it. Your physical ears could not have heard of such a thing. You could have never expected with all of your senses to experience what God would have showed up and done for you or will show up and do for you if you would just trust Him where you are right now. Amen. Help us, Lord, to trust you. Yes. Amen. You know, you can't figure it all out. We surely can't figure out God completely. But what we can do is ask Him for grace to help us settle down and serve Him wherever we are. Yes. And trust that His Word is true. 
and that he will flow peace into our circumstances as we live for him right here, right now. I will say there's one exception. God will never bless sin. So if the neighborhood that we're living in is called sin, then we will need to move out yeah. of that neighborhood for before peace will ever show up yeah. in the house where we're living. Yeah. Point number two. Here we go. We're moving on. Point number two. In God's timing, bad situations change. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and causing you re to return to this place. There's a whole lot of history behind this verse of scripture. And I mean, I don't want, I didn't really even put it in my notes, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to mention it real quick. You know, Israel was disobedient in many areas through those years that I spoke of. They worshiped false gods, even though God warned them. But one other thing that they did was they didn't trust God with their prosperity. That's really the reason that they were put in Babylon for 70 years. See, God told them on every seventh year, you're supposed to let the land rest. Just like every seventh day, you're supposed to rest. Even in the wilderness, you remember what he told them? On the sixth day, you're supposed to gather double the manna so that you have enough for the seventh because I don't want you going out there on the seventh. And if you do, it's going to turn into worms. Mm -hmm. The reality of it is, is that if we're not aware of the fact that we got to trust God, even with our finances, then what we do have, I'm just saying, it can turn into worms. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us. But this seventh year was known also some people, that they'll call it a Shemitah. Right. And on that seventh year, they were supposed to be able to they were to believe and gather enough in the sixth year and that God was going to let the land produce. Whatever. And they, in other words, they weren't supposed to plow. They weren't supposed to sow that. But that God was going to take care of them. And they didn't trust God because, listen, whenever you're over there worshiping false gods, you're not about to trust God also with your finances. And because of that, for the, for the years that they did not trust God in providing on that year, he put them in Babylonian captivity for 70 years. He said, you're not going to let my land rest. You're not going to do what I've called you to do. Well, guess what? I'm going to put you somewhere where you ain't got a choice. I'm going to let my land rest for 70 years. And so he gave this prophecy to Daniel, the prophet, and he explained to them that it would be this time frame would be the amount of time that the children of Israel would be in Babylonian captivity. And now God is reminding Jeremiah, the prophet, that this is how long it's going to be. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon. I'm sorry, it's the opposite. God spoke it to Jeremiah and he reminded Daniel later. For thus says the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and causing you to return to this place. Point number two was this. In God's timing, bad situations change. The place that he promised to return them to was Jerusalem. That's where they had been taken from. That's where he promised he would bring them back to. The name Jerusalem means double peace. Amen? Listen, when you live in a place where God's presence lives, there's peace there. And if that is where you are, you will live in peace. God's promise of timing was that he would bring them back to the peace that their hearts long for. It's going to get better than what it is right now. He won't make you stay in a place of misery, but he is asking you to trust him and live for him and settle down and serve him until he is ready to move you out of the place where you are. How do we live in the place called peace when there is chaos all around? Where there is grace, there is peace. The apostle Paul started all of his epistles like this. He said this, he said, grace and peace be unto you through God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I went back this morning. I just added that this morning. I went back this morning. I looked at all the letters that Paul wrote and somewhere in the introduction, he said, grace and peace be unto you through God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, I felt like I could see myself writing this on the board, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. But you know, what I wanted to say is that where there is grace, there is peace. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is peace. Amen. 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 God's presence was in Israel. That's where God's presence dwelt. The name of that city was called the it, double peace, and God was promising to bring them back in there. But for you and I today, I'm in a situation where I need grace. I need grace in order for peace.
to be provided in my life. You know, one of the things that I try to explain a lot, and many of you already understand this, though, is this, is that in order for me to receive the grace and the peace that I need, I have to have a specific object of faith, right? D does everybody know what the object of our faith is supposed to be? Hmm. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Listen, God has been about this plan of bringing about Jesus to be the answer that we were looking for since the beginning of time. Immediately after mankind fell, Adam and Eve attempted to fix and remedy their own situation by putting fig leaves on their naked, exposed body. But God turned around and killed an innocent animal and clothed them with the skins of an innocent animal, foreshadowing or preaching in thousands of years of human history in advance that the plan was to ultimately give us a lamb that would take away the sin of the world. He went about that plan very methodically by, and I know I've said this many times, but just bear with me by calling a man named Abraham out from his father's house and promising that he would make a nation through him and that through this nation all descendants of the earth would be blessed through his seed and ultimately that seed was Jesus so from Abraham Isaac Isaac Jacob we said it a couple weeks ago Jacob his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of Israel because God changed Jacob's name to Israel and then ultimately in Egypt like an incubator they swelled to a great nation. God delivered them out of the Egyptian bondage by, by the blood that was placed on the doorpost through a sacrifice and ultimately brought them to the place where they were to be. God's plan, he's been writing it for thousands of years, amen, he's not going to change it. When you need grace and peace, then you need to have a right object of faith. Amen. And you got to remember that and you got to stay there. You see, as you keep your faith in Christ and what he did, guess what happens? Jesus, not just who he was, but also Jesus, what he did. Faith in Jesus and what he did, guess what it does? It opens up, this is the believer down here. Believer, short, not Bill, that's weird. <laughs> believer. Guess what it does? It opens up the door. It opens up the door so grace can flow in. Amen. As you keep your faith, Lord, this is kind of like, let me, let, me, let me break it down for you. Let me just put it in some real clothes for you. I'm in a situation. I'm in Babylon. I'm in captivity. I don't like the place where I am. But if I'm honest with myself, I realize that I made some choices that put me here. It's God's will for me to serve him right here. I need grace. Where there's grace, there's peace. Lord, you died to set me free so that I can access grace. I'm going to depend on you, Lord. I'm going to put my faith in you and what you did. And I'm going to believe that because God wrote this plan in advance before man was ever formed, that if I'll keep my faith in the darling of heaven, the one that you promised, the one that you sent to pay the penalty of sin for me, if I will keep my faith in that, it will be pleasing unto you because you bankrupted heaven and you sent your son to die for me. And if I'll keep my faith in that right there today for the next hour, for the next minute, you will flow grace into my situation. Amen. Amen. You will flow, flow grace. And where there's grace, there's peace. Amen. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. The Apostle Paul said this. He said unto me, see, the Apostle Paul was in a situation he didn't like it. Now, granted, for him... <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying, like, I'm just, I'm talking about the preacher now. I had to cry over a little bit of thing, right? I'm over there belly aching about something little. And the Apostle Paul's over here with stripes all over his back after getting beaten by a whip. And he's thrown into a Roman prison. And he ain't got no clothes. And sometimes he doesn't like the situation that he's in. But, he, but whatever it was, he said, Lord, take this from me. And the Lord's response was, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. See, when you find yourself in a bad situation, a bad circumstance, and you feel weak in that situation, if you'll trust in the Lord, he'll give grace. That's when his strength is made perfect. When your strength wears down and you ain't got no more to give, then God shows up. Amen. That's what we need. Amen. We need God to show up because I can't get her done. Right? Let's look at this. So we're, this is, let me go back and remember even what our point is right here. Point number, we're still in, 
Now, this is point number two. God's timing, bad situations change. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, verses 25 through 26. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Yes, Lord. It is good. You know, Lamentations was written by Jeremiah, and it just talks about weeping and crying. In a time of weeping and crying, the Lord is good to them that wait. Mm -hmm. For him to the soul that seeks him, it is a good that a man would hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. In other words, you can't just get so nervous and so antsy and so anxious and you just get up and you keep running to a new location every time it turns around. No, you got to patiently wait Amen. at the will of the Lord and He will bless you in that. Can you trust Him for that? Amen. No, I'm just asking. I'm not just asking you that. I'm asking me that. Can we trust Him for that? That even though the situation is not the way that we want it, even though we're in the midst of a circumstance that we don't like, can we trust God to give us the grace that we need, that His strength would show up? Can we trust that it would just right here, right now, today, serve Him, that He will show up wherever we are, and He would bring peace, and He would bring into the midst of our situation and give us the grace and the strength that we need to move on? Can we yeah. believe it? Amen. Because that's what He's requiring. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Boy, a man can come up with some plans, huh? Yeah. I don't know about you, but I can. I come up with all kind of stuff. Lord help us. All right, point number three. Here we go. Moving forward. We have a tendency to blame everyone, even God for our situation, but God's only intent for us has been good. I can't remember who it was, but, you know, one time I was talking to somebody and they were like, you know, a lot of times whenever we read the Bible and we see all the things that the Lord doesn't like and the things that he, it seems like he's restricting from our lives, the things, in other words, that make us feel good in our flesh, you know what I'm saying? That if we didn't have the word of the Lord and we didn't have the presence of God throttling our behavior, Lord only knows what we would look like. You see what I'm getting at? Like, in other words, you remember the worst time, that the time where you were when you were your worst? Just unbridled, unthrottled, you know, this party or whatever. You know, I'm just saying. I know that's weird, but you get my point. Like, just God does that not because He's trying to restrict us from having fun, but because He knows at the end thereof is destruction. Right. Yeah. He's a good God. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. Like, I'm not trying to take hold back any good thing from you. It's just your understanding of what's good is not good. Right. And it's going to lead to destruction. Right. So we have a tendency to blame everyone, even God, for our situation. But God's only intent for us was good. Right. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. I got a plan for your life. I got an expected end. I already got it formulated in my mind. I see where you're going at the end of the destination. I'm just asking you to trust me till I get you there. Can you do it? Yeah. See, when things aren't going the way we want them to and we feel like we're stuck in a place that we don't like, one of the things that we must always try to do is remember that if God put us there, he put us there for a purpose. And most often his purpose was to prepare us for his plans for us. That's good right there. Prepare us for his plans for us, but more times than not, until we can learn what he's teaching, we will never experience what he's promising. Until we can learn what he's trying to teach us, we can never experience what, he's, what he wants to promise us. Isaiah 58, 14. Then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth. You want a promotion? You want the Lord to prosper you? You want the Lord to bring some grace in your life? Look at this. Delight yourself in the Lord. Man, this is, this is good right here. This is good right here. I don't know if I'm going to do a good job of explaining it, but I'm telling you right now, this is good. Then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. See, this is thousands, of, this is 1,200 years after the promises were given to Jacob. 
I already explained it once in this message, but Jacob had 12 sons. His name was changed to Israel. The 12 sons became the 12 tribes. <coughs> they became the nation. 1,200 years later, Isaiah, from the time of Jacob, is saying, I want to give you the heritage of your father Jacob. Mm -hmm. See, I had a promise for, you, for your, your great-grandpappy. I had a promise for Abraham. I had a promise for, you, for your, your great-grandpa, your great-great-grandpa, your, great, your great-grandpa Isaac. I had a promise for your, your grandpa Jacob. I got a promise for you because, see, you're my children. And the same as though they were the people of God, you also are the people of God. And God has good thoughts for you as an expected end for you. God made those promises. And listen, we are the offspring of the Lord and we need to be reminded that He has good thoughts for us. He wants to give us a future and a hope. It's when He is the delight of our soul. That's what the scripture said. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Now, I don't think you get that. <laughs> then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. Then, when you come to the place where your delight is in the Lord, the things that you're hungry for, the things that bring pleasure to you, the things that make you happy, the things that fill you with joy, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord. That's when I'm going to give you the inheritance of Jacob. But I got to work with you. Because you're not there right now. None of you are there right now. The preacher that you're looking at, he ain't there right now. I need to get you to a place where you will delight yourself in the ways of the Lord. That's when the promised inheritance he has for us becomes our possession. When pleasing him becomes more important to us. Than pleasing ourselves. Come on. Oh no, that was too, that was we got to do that one again. Yes, that's when we get it. When pleasing Him becomes more important to us than pleasing ourselves. Well, that's a hard road to hoe right there. Amen. <laughs> Help us, Lord. Because I got so many different things that I want to be pleasured with. I want to find my own pleasure. I like to feel good. Come on, somebody. I hope you like a preacher that's going to take the trip. All right. Point number four. Here we go. He has a way of bringing us to the right place. Amen? Amen? We might go kicking and screaming, but he is determined to get us there. Oh, that's good. We might go kicking and screaming, but he is determined <laughs> to get us there. <laughs> Can you imagine? You ever, you ever like held a child? They're like, ah, like kicking and screaming and throwing a fit. I get so many things that run through my mind. I got to learn how to shut the switch off. All right. Look at verse 12. He has a way of bringing us to the right place. We might go kicking and screaming, but he is determined to get us there. Verse 12 through 14. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. Then it's kind of like the scripture we just read. When you delight yourself in the Lord, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart and I will be found of you says the Lord and I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you says the Lord and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. You want to know whenever you're going to experience the peace that your heart longs for? You want to know when you're going to end up in the place that I have planned for you? And listen, all this that I have allowed in your life based on your choices, based on your decisions that, that altered your path. Come on, help, help the preacher out. That altered your path and put you in a place where you don't like being, but you're here today. Point number one, live for him today while you're there. You got to make a choice if you're a child of God. Amen. If the Holy Spirit lives in your heart, you're going to have to make a choice. I'm going to serve him today. At some point in time, I got to serve him today. And if you're going to do that, praise God. He's saying that in the meantime, while you're here, I'm doing a work in you. See, whenever there's things going on in your life, when there's trial and tribulation, when there's pressure and circumstance, it causes you to call out on the Lord. You go ahead and try to fix it in your own strength. Big boy, big girl, come on. I mean, there's sometimes, you know, my mama used to say this, Lord, I hope it's okay to say it from behind the pulpit. My mama used to say, you just need to put your big girl panties on. Sometimes it's okay to tell folk that. I mean, we have such a soft society, man, just put your big girl panties on or put your big boy 
britches on, whatever, and just get it done, son. You know, sometimes we just need a little bit of stick to itiveness, if that's a word. Sometimes we just need to get up, put your boots on, and go to work, and quit crying about it. But at the same time, hallelujah, I need the Lord to get me to the place where I need him to get me. And it's a, it's a dichotomy. Like, I need to be able to find the strength that I need. Listen, you think that Paul didn't have some, some, some stick to it in him? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. I mean, there, no, part of that was the Apostle Paul's makeup. Yeah. Right? I mean, beating five times with whips. I mean, I'm pretty sure one time with a whip would probably calm me down quite a bit. <laughs> Five times with a whip, three times with a rod. You know, I know I say this almost every sermon. <laughs> Shipwrecked and left in the deep overnight. I'm pretty soon I'm going to be like, man, I must be out of God's will, dude. This kind of stuff don't happen to people that are in God's will. At least Joel Osteen would say, or, you know, Brother Copeland would say, you're out of God's will, brother. You need to confess a better life for yourself, okay? How are you going to convince the Apostle Paul of that as he sits in the Mamertine prison? His back's so scarred up, he can't even move. He can't even bend over. Stoned and left for dead and got up and shook the dust off and said, let us go to the next town and preach the gospel for it. This is why I've been called. Called to do the work of the Lord. Yeah, sometimes life's going to be hard, folks. And I know right now we're all fired up. We, yeah, we're like ready to take on the world. And when we walk out the doors, the enemy starts attacking again. <laughs> Lord, help us. Amen. Give us strength Amen. to trust you. Yes. Yes. God wants our heart to be broken and contrite when we are seeking him. That's what I'm trying to say. He puts you in a situation. Yes, I made choices. Yes, I made decisions. It altered my pathway. Yeah. I went down a wrong pathway. I ended up in a place that I don't like being. But God will use that to bring us to a place where our heart is broken and contrite before him. And that's what he really wanted to begin with. That's right. He just didn't want a little piece of you. It's not like Jesus said, okay, lop off my pinky and you can nail it to the cross. <laughs> no, that wasn't going to work. Jesus gave his whole self. Yes. Amen. And he's not going to be pleased with little bitty. You, you think it's some big deal? That, listen, you know me. I'm over here. Like, Please come to church. You know, I don't want to preach in an empty crowd. I don't. But you know what? You think it's some big deal? You got up on a Sunday morning and came to church? Come on, folks. Really? Come on. Yeah, what are we supposed to do? Pat everybody on the back, give you a cupcake? <laughs> I mean, you, you, Jesus died on the cross. He hung naked in the new day sun. He paid the penalty for your sin. And now we're going to feel all good about ourselves because we got up. We got to get up. We got to. What I'm saying is we were allowed the privilege to get up this morning and to come into the house of the Lord and to worship him. Even if the music isn't exactly like I like it. Even if the preaching isn't exactly like I like it. Is worthy. Jesus right. is worthy to receive glory and honor. Hallelujah. God is good. He wants our heart to be broken and contrite when we're seeking him. He wants all of us. Yeah. Amen. He wants us to come to the end of ourselves and quit playing games with him. He wants us to seek him with all our hearts, not just a part of our heart. And then when we do that, he will move and he will deliver. When you seek me, you will find me. When you seek me with all of your heart, then I'm going to bring you back to that place that you were looking for, that place of peace. Hallelujah. That I brought you out of and I put you here. But the purpose was to get you back over there. Amen. Because you didn't even appreciate it when you were there the right. first time. That's right. Amen. That's right. That was good right there. <laughs> this is what the Lord said through Jeremiah. I'm getting ready to close. Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 16 through 17. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see. In other words, what he's saying is, I want you to go out to the crossroads and I want you to look. Get out there on the street and look. He says, and I want you to ask for the old path. He's, he's, he's talking about it. You know, he's using it as an illustration, a street, a path, a, a, a way that you're going, a direction. But it's a spiritual thing. Look back for the old path. What are you talking about? The right way. There's a right way to do things. Man, we're so messed up in this modern church, man. We're trying to make everything so modern, so groovy, so cool that we're forgetting that there's a right way. There's an old path. And it's not legalism. We don't want to go back to that. But it's the right path. It's the old way. It's God's way. It's the right way. Yes. Where is the good way? And walk in there. He wants you to ask 
You need to ask. I need to ask. What is the right way, Lord? Yes, Lord. And then walk therein. Yes. Also, look at this. I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. I'm sorry. It said, walk, he said, walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. Mm -hmm. Also, I set watchmen over you saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. Mm -hmm. That's the danger of the child of God right there. Yeah. I don't want to listen to what you're saying because what you're saying isn't what I want to hear. That's right. Then it gets so bad that the people that God did call to speak forth his word, if they were really called. Mm -hmm. See, that's a whole other thing. You remember what he told them in this passage that we read earlier to get our message from? He said, don't listen to them prophets and them diviners because I didn't send them. Yeah. They're trying to talk to you about something that I didn't tell them to say. Right. Lord, help us. That's the modern church. You got preachers on television telling you one thing and it ain't the word of the Lord. The Lord saying, I called the men that I called as watchmen over you and told them for you to listen to the sound of the trumpet. They won't listen. No, we don't, we don't want to listen. How, what, how do we expect the church of God? How do we expect the people of God to be able to head in the right direction when the people that God called to speak forth his word won't even say what God called us to say? Right. Amen. Lord, help us. Help your preacher. Help me. Sometimes they'll see things. I'm like, I'm supposed to say that. Yep. You, it's my word. <laughs> That's one of the things that the Lord told me a long time ago. Get your, listen, he don't talk to you the way he talks to me. Maybe I get it. Get your grubby little fingers out of my word. Get your grubby little fingers. Because you over there, mankind's wanting to manipulate my word. Oh, give them a topical message on the love of God. It's like ocean spray upon my face. You're so, you're so beautiful. Yeah, he is beautiful. And yes, his love, it can be refreshing like an ocean spray on your face. But at the same time, it's going through all of this lovely, colorful, illustrative language. And it's never getting down to the gruesomeness of Jesus having to die on a cross to bear the penalty of man's sin. Now, Never having to deal with your sin. Never having to, having to deal with the Savior of sin. Never finding your sp place in the right spot with the right object of faith. How in the world are you ever supposed to be delivered out of the mess that you're in if you, nobody ever tells you the truth? Right. Amen. Amen. Lord, help us. Yes. There's an established path that God has voiced through his word. There's a right and a wrong in every situation and circumstance. The child of God must search for that path with all his heart. And when he finds it, he must walk in it. That's the will of the Lord. Sadly, the text explains that we don't submit easily. And also, there's many times the word of the, the man of God doesn't want to speak forth the word of God. Look at Psalms 32, verses 8 through 9. The Lord said this, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which you shall go. I will guide thee with my eye. I mean, look, if we just stop right there, that's so beautiful. People used to tell me that I was a negative preacher. Sure. I'm not. And I'm not. I just keep reading. And I'm not a negative preacher. I'm not. I just keep reading and I'm just trying to give the whole picture. But if we just stop right there, how beautiful would that be? I will instruct you. Have you ever felt like you needed direction somewhere? I have stopped before. Listen, I'm not one of them men that won't stop. I stop because I don't have much of a sense of direction. I'm like, excuse me, can you tell me da 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 da? I can tell you that there's been a couple of times that I know them people <laughs> sent me down the wrong path <laughs> on purpose, but it's only happened about twice. <laughs> All the other times people were good enough to me. It might have been some crazy looking neighborhoods. It didn't matter. They still treated me right. I got some good stories about that, but I'm not going to go. I'm just saying, have you ever been in a situation where you needed some direction? Look what the Lord of glory said. The God that scattered the stars in the sky, I like saying that, and breathed life into a lump of clay. That's the God you serve. He said, I will instruct you. I'll be your teacher. Thank you, I'll be your GPS. Amen. You don't need Siri. No. I'm going to be there for you. I will instruct you and teach you. I will be your teacher in the way that you should go. Amen. I will guide you with my own eye. Man, that's good right there. The Lord sees in advance. Yes, he, does. he promises that he will lead and guide you. You remember what I said early on when I started this message that many times we find ourselves in a situation and I used a woman, a woman that might have been abused, right? 
emotionally, physically, whatever, whatever. And it's not their fault that they ended up there. But at the same time, because in other words, they're not the ones that were abusing themselves. But at the same time, don't tell me that God didn't send warning calls. And that's the point that I'm trying to make. God knew in advance what was going to happen. That's why part of the instruction that he gives us is to teach us. At some point in time, we might get wise if we would start to listen to the still, small voice. Amen. You see what I'm getting at? Amen. But it seems so, like right then is what I want. I know I need, right. to, I need to hustle up. Listen. Right then is what I want. Mm -hmm. Right then it just seems so good. And he's like, pss, 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 don't do it. Don't go that way. And it's like, yeah, but that voice is so small compared to the desire that I have to go this way. Amen. Okay. But after you've been through that, this is the good news. After you've been in Babylon mm. and you let him teach you, at some point in time, you're going to start listening. Amen. Either that or you'll be destroyed. Sooner or later, we're going to start listening to the voice of the Lord. He says, I will instruct you. I will teach you. My eye will lead you. He sees so far in advance. He knows the destination before you get there. Trust him. Amen. But look at this. Don't be like the horse or the mule, which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle lest they come near unto you. I always love that scripture. <laughs> I mean, the first time I read that, I'm like, that's me right there. I'm like a stubborn mule. You know what I'm saying? Like I have been in the past anyway. Well, I don't want to be no stubborn mule. I really don't. I want to be broken in the eyes of the Lord, man. How's God going to use me if I think I'm, you know? I remember one time I wrote, and I'm not, well, I'm not going to say that's weird. But, but can imagine like a mule that refuses to go. He just, he just puts his hindquarters in. Sinks low, and, and, and his master's over there, got a bit of bridle in his hand, he's trying to pull him. Can't pull him, can't get him where he needs him to go. You know, the Lord's saying, Would you just trust me? The Apostle Paul, you know what? There's good news though. Listen, if you feel as though you have been like that, like a stubborn mule who the Lord cannot get where he needs him to go without bit and bridle, you, you're in good company. Can I tell you that? Yeah. You know why I know that? Because the Apostle Paul, we talked about that. Last week in the book of Acts, right? I mean, I'm sorry, on Wednesday night we talked about that in the book of Acts. How, the, how Saul was breathing threats against the church. How he went to Damascus to get letters, right? And what did the Bible say? That the Lord knocked him down on the ground and blinded him. And said, Saul, Saul, why do you kick against the goads is one way you could say it. And the goad was a pointy stick that they would use to stick in a horse's hindquarters or a sheep's hindquarters or a goat. Because goats are stubborn. Stick them in their hindquarters to push them in the right direction. And, and, and Paul says, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm the Lord Jesus, whom you persecute. Mm -hmm. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. I'm over here trying like a like you're a stubborn mule with a bit in your mouth, and I'm over here trying to pull you in the right direction, but you won't go. The point that I'm trying to make is, is this. If you feel like, well, golly, preacher, I feel like you're preaching to me. Guess what? You're in good company. Because when the Lord shows up and he allows the situation that finally brings you to your breaking point, we all have a saturation point. Every last one of us can rebel against the Lord for a period of time, but we all have a saturation point. And you either be broken under the hand of God or you will be ground into powder. The cornerstone will not be denied. That's right. One way or another, it's going to happen. Lord, help us.